Greetings once again in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the New Year Bible broadcast on Church Media TT, the YouTube channel. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for looking at these programs and these lessons. I really truly pray that you are encouraged, that you're receiving knowledge and information to put you in a better position where your life is concerned and where your belief is concerned. Because as you know, it matters a lot what we believe according to the scriptures. And if we are able to see what God says, understand what he says, then the conclusion is, let us live in accordance to his word. Let us live by faith. Because that's the reason why we are here today, living by faith under the new covenant. Again, I pray that you would have a prosperous week to come. And whatever trials or situation that we need to face in life, let us continue to hold on to God and seek his grace and his mercies. All right? Please join me in prayer before we go further with our lesson. Eternal God and righteous Father in heaven, we humbly bow before the divine throne of grace. We pray, Father, that you would bless all those who are viewing and listening to this program, that they will be drawn closer to you. We pray, Father, for our nation and those who lead our nation, that they will do so with humility and your wisdom. We pray, Father, for all those who are seeking after your will and purpose, that with diligence they would search your word and come to know you and understand your truth. We also pray that, God, for many who are contemplating giving their life to you, that they would do so before it is eternally too late. We pray that your words will always find a resting place in our hearts, and may you guide us accordingly, as we ask this prayer in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. Yes, we have been uh, seeking and have been answering a very important question. What, what, was, what law was nailed to the cross? And looking at the book of uh, Colossians, and specifically into chapter 2, from verse number 14, and we parallel over into Ephesians in our last study to see how beautiful these texts work and how they are able to be harmonizing with each other in understanding what God had said through the Apostle Paul that the cross of Jesus Christ, very important, very important in, in history, the cross of Jesus Christ, what it represents. You know, crucifixion was at once uh, an execution, a pillory of an instrument of torture. We spoke about the Roman cross consisting of a straight piece of wood erected in the earth, often with a, trans, uh, a transverse beam fastened across its top. And another piece near the bottom on which the crucified person's feet were nailed, as was the cross on which Jesus uh, suffered. We understand that he suffered greatly. And him being on the cross, he suffered and died for our sins. But we also spoke about the reasons why he was on the cross that he had to nail the handwriting of ordinances. He had to nail the Mosaic law. He had to nail that which is known as the old covenant today. So by nailing it on the cross and by dying when he rose again, it was the introduction of the new covenant. And we saw that and we realized how important it is for us to understand the necessity of living under the new covenant. So just by review, what did we look at in Colossians chapter number 2? Uh, from verse number 14. You can turn in your Bibles, you will see there. Colossians 2 from verse number 14. We saw that Jesus blotted it out. Yes. Which means to cause something to cease by obliterating any evidence, to eliminate it, to wipe it away. He did that with the handwriting of ordinances. He took it out of the way to remove, to withdraw, to abolish the validation of something. So no longer is it in force to be used to say it's a measure of authority and guidance for us today. He nailed it to the cross. It has been fixed or fixed on the cross. It has been placed there so that his death will not only take our sins, but take that same Mosaic law and its system to the cross. And now we are not 
under it. We are not under it. Figuratively, of what is under the power or authority of any person or thing, we are not under it. Because he removed it, because it has been abolished, it has been disannulled, we are not under its control. And that's the reason why we must realize in Galatians chapter 4, from verse number 1 to 5, I'm going to read in the basic Bible English, the Apostle Paul said, but I say that as long as the son is a child, he is in no way different from a servant, though he is Lord of all, but is under keepers and managers till the time fixed by the father. So we, when we were young, we were kept under the first rules of this world, but when the time has come, God sent out his son, made of a woman, made under the law. You see, the Jews found themselves in that situation where even though you were supposed to be heirs in God's kingdom, you were kept under the law until the time of Christ. When the time of Christ came, that changed. Everything changed because in verse number 5, he would say that he might make them free who were under the law hmm, and that we might be given the place of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent all the spirit of the son into your heart saying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer servants, even though you grow up under the law system. But now that has changed. And because it has changed, we must understand that today under the new covenant, things would have changed. Galatians chapter 3, verse number 22 following. The scripture had concluded all on the sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before, get this now, before faith came, we were kept under the law. We were shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster, our tutor, to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after the faith has come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. Wow. See, we are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. We are no longer under the authority of the law. We're no longer obligated to fulfill the law. And when I say the law, what does that mean? The Ten Commandments, the statutes, the testimonies, the judgments. We are no longer obligated to fulfill what was written in that book of covenant that Moses wrote. So Paul made it clear in the book of Romans four specific things. All right? Turn with me to the book of Romans chapter 6, if you will. And let's see what these four specific things that Paul made quite clear about know that we are not under the law. Romans chapter 6 from verse number 15. Hear the words of the Apostle Paul. What then? Shall we sin? Because we are not under the law? You see, that's some of the questions that people were wondering about. But if the law is removed, what about thou shalt not steal? What about thou shalt not commit adultery? What about thou shalt not do this? And some people include, what about remember the Sabbath, keep it holy? So we, we include all of these things because of what Jesus did on the cross. We didn't understand specifically what he did. So Paul is saying, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace, God forbid? Knowing not that to whom you yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So yes, the law says, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery. That's under the Ten Commandment law. Under the New Commandment, God still says, you cannot commit adultery. You cannot steal. But you see, the consequences of the Old Testament law is that if you steal or if you commit adultery, you would have been stoned to death. Under the new covenant law, you have grace. That's why he talked about it there. But we are under grace in verse 15. Being under grace means you have the opportunity to go before God, to ask for forgiveness, and we can be forgiven as long as we do that genuinely. But to whom you offer yourself, servants, then that is who you're going to obey. But God be thanked in verse 17 that you were the servants of sin. But you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. What form of doctrine? Are we going back to the law again? Are we going back to the same statutes and, and, and judgments and testimonies? No. But you have obeyed from the heart the form, the pattern of doctrine that, that liberated us from the law, that set us free in Christ Jesus. That's why Paul would have said in Galatians, 
you know, that we have liberty in Christ Jesus because we are set free from the yoke of bondage, which is the law. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. So when Paul said we are not under the law, it doesn't mean that you can do what we want. No. It doesn't mean that we can still commit acts of sinfulness that were mentioned under the Ten Commandments and say, well, you know, we are free. No. Under the New Covenant, there are still the New Covenant laws that forbid committing the very same acts. But the things that have changed are the ones that we need to identify because under the Levitical system, the priests would have served in helping men to be free from the guilt of their sins at a certain time. But we have Jesus. <laughs> but the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus. So we are no longer under the obligation of keeping the law. Whether statutes, judgment, testimonies, or the Ten Commandments. The second thing Paul said, which is very important, I want us to understand this, is found in Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7 from verse number 1. You know, sometimes we use this text a lot to refer to marital uh, discussion in terms of divorce and so forth. But Paul was referring to the law. And this is what he said pertaining to the law. All right? Look at Romans chapter 7, reading from verse number 1. Knowing not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. As long as he lives. For the woman which has an husband is bound by the law to her husband, as long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she's loose from the law of her husband. She's free. Verse 3. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she's free from that law. So she's no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, here he comes. This is the analogy he's drawing. Wherefore, my brethren, you are also become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, and we should bring forth fruit unto God. So we have become dead to the law because we are no longer married to the law. We have been set free from the law. We have been set free from its obligation. And because we have been set free, we are married to Christ. We are under his law, under his rules. I read again verse number 4 in the basic Bible English. In the same way, my brothers, you were made dead to the law through the body of Christ. So that you might be joined to another, even to him who came again from the dead, so we might give fruit to God. Wow. So as long as we are baptized into Christ, as long as we are part of the body of Christ, the law has no authority or force over us. As a matter of fact, the law has no authority or force over anyone anymore because of what Jesus did when he died on the cross. The third thing that Paul says is found in Romans chapter number 7, verse number 5 and 6. We are not only not under the law, obligated to the law, we are not only dead to the law because we are married to Christ, but we are delivered from the law, Romans chapter 7, verse 5 and 6. For when we were in the flesh, the motions, the passions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. That's why we couldn't escape. We could not escape. But verse 6, but now we are delivered from the law, having been made dead to that which had power over us. So the law did have that kind of uh, level of captivity, what he's saying to the Jews. It did have that level of captivity over us, yes. That, that we should now uh, be held against the will and the freedom of what Christ brought for us. So those who are living under the law and its requirements, you are still shackled, you are still in prison. But those who are in Christ, you are made free. That's why he said in verse number 6, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So that we are servants in the new way of the spirit, not in the old way of the letter. So Paul says, we are no longer under the law, we are no longer under the obligation of fulfilling the requirements of the law. We are dead to that law, we are delivered from the law. And what law are we referring to? Quite clearly, the same Mosaic law, the same law of ordinances. How do we know that? Verse number 7. What shall we say then? He asks the question. Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. 
I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. What does that mean, folks? Well, Paul made reference to something that was mentioned under the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not covet. So if he's saying that we are no longer under the obligation of such a law, under the new covenant, we don't steal, we don't commit adultery, we don't covet, but under the new covenant, which is under grace, we learn not to commit these sinful acts. So when the law was nailed to the cross, it was not only the sacrifices and the priestly system and the feast days and all of those things, but also it was the Ten Commandments affixed to the law affixed to the cross sorry and therefore in verse 8 he says but sin taken occasion by the commandment it worked in me all manner of concupiscence or evil desires for without the law sin was dead paul you made it quite clear we are not no longer under the law we are dead to that law because we are married to christ we're delivered from the law because we are now serving christ and and that law we've spoken of is that same Mosaic law, that same law that contains the book of the covenant, which enshrines everything that Moses had written. Does that mean that the Old Testament is not valuable to us today? No. The scripture says in Romans chapter 15 and verse number 4, whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. Get this now. Our learning. That we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Where is our hope? Our hope is in Christ Jesus. So if it is that the scriptures are pointing us to Christ, the law has no obligation over us, no power or authority, because it was just our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. So the scriptures are there for our learning. The scripture is not only there for our learning, but it's also for our example and admonition. Because all the things happen in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 from verse number 6. All the things happen to the children of Israel where they found themselves committing idolatry, where they found themselves committing fornication, where they tempted Christ and they murmured. He said, all the things that happened in the past, these things that happened for our examples, to learn not to lust after these things, as Israel lusted after these things. So the Old Testament is there for our learning, to give us hope, pointing us in the direction of Christ. The Old Testament is there for examples of how to live our lives, to avoid sinful things and things that displeases God. The Old Testament are there to, to warn us that the same way God dealt with his people in the past when they violated his command and rules, God is saying today, his rules and his regulations of the new covenant is there also to admonish us. So then that simply means that the law is no longer in force, but the new covenant to guide us and to keep us. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 28. Jesus, when he was instituting the supper, known as the Lord's Supper, he said this, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And it's very interesting that Jesus made that statement by saying, this is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Paul the Apostle made mention of something like that, but I want us to realize how important and significant it is. In the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter number 3, Paul would have said in verse number 5, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also had made us, get this now, able ministers of the New Testament. Not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kill it, but the spirit give it life. What is Paul saying? He said, God had made us able ministers of the New Testament. What did Jesus say? He said that we are under the New Testament by which we can have forgiveness of sins. So folks, that simply indicates that while the Old Testament is there for our learning, our example, and our ad admonition, we live under the New Testament. Testament. So Paul in the book of Colossians chapter 2 made it clear that God had done this when he nailed the old covenant to the cross. Once again, I want to thank you for staying with us here on the New York Bible broadcast. There's another lesson that will bring conclusion to all of what we have been saying, but I hope that you'll be able to stay with us because when you do so, you realize it's only through the cross 
of Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, that we have, under the new covenant, the opportunity to obey the gospel, to be saved, not following the rituals of men, but following just the pure gospel as it is. You have heard the message, believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. John 8 and verse 24, if you don't believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Jesus said we need to repent, Luke 13, verse 3 and 5. Repent of your sins. If you don't repent, you will perish. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, he said you need to confess. Confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And when you confess, it will lead you unto salvation. You're not saved as yet. Until Acts chapter 2, verse number 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That is the plan of salvation. Hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized because it's under the New Testament. And if you're living under the New Testament, you will be saved. But under the Old Testament, you will still be held in captivity and be lost. I pray that this message was a blessing to you as we continue to search the scriptures to find out the truth of God's will. May God bless you. I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. What the Bible tells me, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. That he died on Calvary, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe That he came to set me free in me So I might live with him in glory I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe When the Bible tells me I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe That he died on Calvary, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe and he came to set the people free. So I might live with him in glory.